let's address the argument that the Founding Fathers couldn't possibly have known what developments there would be in firearms between then and now. That's a popular argument used by the left trying to curtail rights that many of us on the right feel are precious. Now here's the very controversial little piece of the document here. This is the Second Amendment to the Constitution in its entirety, ladies and gentlemen, a well-regulated militia being necessary for the security of a free state, comma, separate topic, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Now this is the one that gets people in an uproar. Oh my word. W were we talking about the fact that this was the the common weapon of the day, you know, something that was a a, a single shot weapon had to be reloaded, and uh, you had to reload between every time and firing. The the founding fathers couldn't possibly have known that one day we would have this evil critter. Now, by the way, this is a civilian model. It just looks to a person on the right looks cool. To a person on the left, it looks scary. Well, why does it look scary? Well, you know, it's it's got stuff that looks military on it. It's got a sling and it's got a telescoping stock and a pistol grip and it's got a it's got a big magazine and, and it's got some type of scope, maybe maybe like a laser red dot type scope or something on it. Well, again, I'm being a little facetious, but still, they the founding fathers probably didn't envision this when they were talking about this, because there was nothing even remotely like it. But there's two things that we're going to talk about. One is, and, and this has been argued, and this has actually been been disproven. It's quite handily. There were multiple fire weapons back in that day that either fired multiple chambers and and could be fired one after the other. Uh, there were weapons in that day that actually could fire. There was the pickle gun, and there was another gun that was actually taken along by Lewis and Clark on their journey. I believe it could fire 22 rounds a minute, as I recall, and was actually air powered. It was completely different than any other weapon of its day, primarily. And so the argument that argument's already starting to fall apart that the Founding Fathers weren't talking about multiple fire weapons. Yeah, but let's apply that liberal logic, or at least the the logic that is being pursued there. Let's apply that to the First Amendment of the Constitution. The First Amendment of the Constitution says, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. Now, we're going to talk about one specific part of the First Amendment, uh, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. Now, let's apply liberal logic, or that type of logic, to the First Amendment. First and foremost, the Founding Fathers could not have pictured all of the amazing changes uh, just in printing presses. They could not have envisioned uh, all of these other things that were going to take place any more than they could have known what was going to happen with firearms. This is a huge change, but the fundamental is still there. As someone who leans conservative, I believe I have a right to this. Now let's talk about the First Amendment from that same liberal viewpoint, that, that logic. This is approximately a printing press that would have been known to them in that day. There were others, but this is something that would have been something they would have been able to identify with. Freedom of speech in that day primarily comprised two elements. You could write it, you could say it, or you could print it. So you could write a letter and say, you know, Dag Nabbit, I don't agree with this. And you could send it to a friend, you could send it to uh, whoever was in office, and you could address the fact that you were upset. You could print it and distribute it, uh, which was very common, uh, newspapers and similar. So there was just a couple of forms of communication uh, in that era that would be, by that same argument, protected under freedom of speech, because they could not possibly have known about these sophisticated megaphones we have now where we can shout out to an entire crowd. <gasps> Microphones? <gasps> Telephones? I can call Dubai. I can call anywhere in the world and have a conversation with somebody and express my freedom of speech. Well, they couldn't possibly have been talking about that because they couldn't possibly have known that telephones were going to exist. It's quite a while if you want to look it up between the birth of the telephone and the forming of the, of the Constitution. Cell phones? Radios? Televisions? CDs and DVDs, I can now take and create a CD or DVD of what I'm saying right now. I'm digitally recording this as I say it right now. That couldn't possibly have been covered by the First Amendment. 
wait a minute, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof, which is talking about religion, or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. Gosh, that's that's very specific. It's very carefully worded. It doesn't say, uh, thou shalt not prevent the use of printing presses and quill pens in the writing of letters, or in the use of the king's English in the town square. It doesn't say that. It says that you cannot stop someone from expressing their freedom of speech, their First Amendment right. Interesting. Today we've got bloggers that can get on the internet and blog about any topic. Uh, you can you can download MP3s and 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 listen to any number of, of digital formats of music and of audiobooks. That's the problem I have with taking the Second Amendment and saying you don't have a right because they couldn't possibly have known. Well, first and foremost, they knew that language evolved. English was not the primary language of the United States at that time. There were many languages spoken here, German just being one of them. Many languages were spoken here. They were protecting the free expression of speech, whether it was printed, written, spoken, whatever. They were protecting it the same way that they protected with the Second Amendment in the second part of the Second Amendment, comma, the right of the people, that would be us, you and I, to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Gosh darn it, that's pretty specific. Why do I, why do I find signs like this, now this is deliberately designed to be ludicrous, but this is what I find gun-free zones to be. I personally have protected my family uh, from being attacked by someone that told multiple someones that told me that they were going to rape my wife and my two stepdaughters. Uh, and by allowing them to know that I was armed, multiple people left rapidly in an environment where we would have been doomed because law enforcement could not have arrived in time to save us. Had I not had that weapon on me, we would have been in real trouble. I would probably be dead at the very least, and the honor and dignity of my wife and my two stepdaughters would be, at the very least, damaged. And so that's why I don't like gun-free zones any more than I think that free, you know, a freedom of speech, First Amendment expression areas are a good idea. That makes no sense to me at all. It not only is this sign, or any sign that where it says down here, by the way, a permit may be required. What? Let's read the First Amendment again. Abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, you can't actually do that. And there are lawsuits right now in place trying to prevent and take down these signs and get rid of these freedom of speech zones where you're only allowed to use your freedom of speech in those zones. And those lawsuits are being won by Americans every day who are defending the freedom of speech the same way that I am an ardent patriot who defends the right to bear arms. So hopefully this gives you something to think about. If you've never thought it about this way or if you're talking to someone, you can use some of this logic to help them to understand the logic that they're using to approach the Constitution is flawed and skewed. You guys have a great day.